My name is, is Mark Ryan. Uh, I'm a software architect. I work for Intel's uh, Open Source Technology Center in Paris. Um, so the title of the talk is Hands-On DLNA. And the goal of the talk is really to introduce you all to DLNA technology, to um, look at how DLNA technology might be applicable to the automotive industry, and, uh, and to demonstrate that many of the common DLNA use cases, use cases are already implementable using open source technologies. Okay, so we should start off really with explaining what DLNA is. So uh, DLNA, it stands for the Digital Living Network Alliance. So the name in itself is a little meaningless, but uh, in essence, the DLNA is an industry body um, that publishes guidelines to describe how can we, um, consumer devices can share media content. So to give you some examples of the sort of things you can do with DLNA, you could uh, take an image, um, you could take a picture with your smartphone camera, and then push that image to your television set so everyone can, can see the image. Or you could um, download a movie onto a set-top box, and then you could watch that movie from any device in your house, such as a tablet or a PC. So DLNA is all about media share. Um, Okay, so I mentioned that, uh, that the DLNA published a set of guidelines. We should talk about these guidelines in a little bit more detail. Um, so the guidelines, they specify an environment for media sharing. Um, and uh, the idea here is this environment should require virtually no configuration on behalf of the user. So the user should just be able to take their tablet, they should connect it up to their local area network, and they should instantly be able to take advantage of all the DLNA services on that network. So DLNA is built heavily on existing standards such as UPnP, HTTP, RTSP, and JPEG. Um, the guidelines have a very strong focus on interoperability. Uh, and they do this by sort of, you know, mandating a set of protocols and a set of guidelines that everybody needs to implement, but they also specify a minimum set of um, file formats that all DLNA devices need to implement. So, um, you know, it means that at some level, all DLNA devices from the same region um, can display uh, the same content. Uh, and finally, these, uh, these guidelines are backed up by a certification program, and so this ensures that um, you know, people uh, who implement DLNA devices uh, adhere to all the, the guidelines, um, and they also organize uh, plug fests two or three or four times a year um, that allow you know, manufacturers to get together and test their pre-release products against each other. So when these products come onto the market, you know, the manufacturers can be confident that they will work against you know, competing products. Okay, so uh, how does DLNA work? Um, well, um, the DLNA defines two main types of devices, and you can see these devices on the right-hand side of the screen. So we have something called a digital media server. This is the, the, the first device. And a digital media server is basically um, a device that allows you to publish media content on the local area network. And when I say publish media content, what I really mean here is the device exposes APIs um, that can be used by other remote devices on the same network, and these APIs allow these remote devices to browse and search the media content, and also to stream it. Okay, so I can give you a couple examples of, of how you might use a DMS. Um, you could put a DMS into some network attached storage, and you could consolidate all of your media onto the storage. Uh, all of your MP3 files, all of your videos could be attached on it, stored on the storage, and then because of the DMS publishing this media, any device connected to the network, such as your tablet, your smartphone, can consume this media. A second, second example would be um, to have a DMS on a set-top box. And so, you know, this is the use case you've already talked about. You would download your movie onto the set-top box, and you would be able to stream that movie to any other device in your house. Um, so that's the DMS. The second um, type of device is called a digital media renderer, or DMR for short. And a digital media renderer is basically a media player um, that, be, that can be controlled by remote devices. Um, so typically, a digital media renderer is often a television set. Um, so you can imagine that you could kind of, um, from your smartphone, your tablet computer, you could instruct your television set to begin playing a movie, uh, or to stop playing a movie, or you could increase the volume or mute the, the television set. Um, so that's a digital media renderer. Now you notice I've added two little car icons um, yeah, with the digital media servers and digital media renders, and that is because you know I think there are use cases um, for these devices inside uh, inside um, IPI systems, and we'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. 
Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we have a set of uh, DLNA applications. And DLNA <coughs> applications are applications which are capable of discovering digital media servers and digital media renderers and consuming their services. So the DLNA defines some classic um, two main types of applications. Uh, the first is called a digital media player, and this is like a, a normal media player, but in addition to being able to being able to play local files stored on the device, they can also discover digital media servers and browse and search and stream their content. Okay? So it's a digital media, it's a media player that can play remote content. And secondly, we have something a little bit more complicated, and this is called a digital media controller. And a digital media controller, like a media player, can discover um, DMSs, digital media servers, and browse and search their content. But um, instead of playing the content locally, it can instruct um, a digital media render to play the content. So to give you an example, um, let's say that uh, you have this movie downloaded onto your set-top box. The set-top box is the digital media server. You want to watch this movie in your bedroom, and you have a smart television in your bedroom. The smart television is the digital media renderer. And you're lying on your bed, you don't want to get up, so you have your tablet computer in your hand, and the tablet computer is the controller. So the controller instructs the television, the renderer, to stream media from the server. Okay, and that's a digital media controller. So these are the two classic DNA applications. But uh, you know, it's interesting to note that we are not bound by um, the limits of these applications. And, and in fact, if you think about it, any application that can download or create media content can make use of the services of digital media servers and digital media members. And we'll see some examples of such applications uh, a little later on. OK, so why should the automotive industry care about DLNA? Well. It turns out that DLNA is becoming ubiquitous. So um, every, uh, every smart television supports DLNA. A lot of game consoles, such as Xbox 360, um, PlayStation, all have DLNA support. Every Windows PC has DLNA support. A lot of um, tablets and smartphones do, particularly those made by Samsung, all come with DLNA uh, built into them out of the box. Um, there are currently 20,000 certified devices, and it's estimated by next year there will be 1 billion DLNA devices in consumers' hands. So, you know, DLNA is, is becoming ubiquitous. Um, now, if I understand correctly, one of the major goals of IBM systems is to be able to handle media content. And so it seems to me that um, you know, the ability of these IBI systems to be able to share media content with consumers' devices is going to be a very important selling point. Uh, and in addition, um, you know, DLNA seems like a good way to do this. And the reason is that DLNA it's very widely deployed, as we've already seen, uh, and also it's based on industry standards, not proprietary protocols. Okay, so I tried to have a think about how DLNA might be used in, in the automotive industry. Uh, a little warning here, I'm not, uh, I'm not really in marketing, uh, this is not really my area. You guys may have a much better idea of how this stuff might be used, but these were the three use cases that I could come up with. So to start off with, um, the user um, has a tablet device, he goes on to some um, movie site and he downloads, pays and downloads for a movie. The movie is protected content, um, and uh, you know he wants to play the movie for his children when he goes on a two-hour ride. So he wants to play the movie out through the IBI system in the back seats of the car, and so he can do this with DLNA. So in this in this situation, the you know the tablet might act as a DMS and a digital media server and digital media controller, and the car itself would be acting as a digital media. <coughs> Um, you could also have an in-car media server, so you could consolidate all of your media and store it in your car, and then um, you know it would be accessible to you through any of your devices while you're driving. And so this is an interesting use case because it means you know as long as all the people in the car have their own DLNA mobile phone or DLNA tablet, they can all listen to different media um, through their headphones or uh, watch different movies um, at the same time. So it's not a particularly sociable use case, but I can imagine that in any families with teenage, uh, teenage children, this is probably quite an interesting thing to be able to do. So if you've got a, a digital media server in your car, it's likely that you have one in your home as well. And so it would be nice if you could keep the two uh, synchronized. So you know, if you purchase new media um, and you upload it to your digital media server um, at home, you also want to have it in your car so you can listen to it in your car. And you can do all this sort of stuff automatically with DLNA. So you could set system, you could set your car up so when you drive into your garage, your car automatically connects to the local area network in your house. 
it wakes up the digital media server in your house, and then there's a synchronization protocol inside DLNA, and you can use this to um, download all the latest files uh, onto your car's um, digital media server. So the next time you go for a drive, you have all your files there. Okay, so um, DLNA is pretty complex protocol, pretty complex specification. The guidelines are thousands and thousands of pages long, and they reference other standards such as UPnP, which are also very large, and HTTP and so forth. So implementing a DLNA device from scratch, so implementing something like a digital media server from scratch, is actually a huge amount of work. Um, and not only do you have to write the code, but you also need to you know, make sure it works with all the different devices that are made by other manufacturers, make sure you have good interoperability, uh, you know, ideally you should get the thing certified as well. So it's just an enormous amount of work. Um, but the good news is that you don't need to implement um, these devices from scratch. And the reason is that there is a, a set of open source projects that are designed to work together to implement a complete DLNA solution. So there are three projects in total. Um, the first one is called GUPNP, and this is a set of four libraries that implements a UPnP stack. So UPnP stands for Universal Plug and Play, and this is the sort of the major protocol upon which DLNA is based. So every DLNA device and every DLNA application needs a UPnP stack um, to be able to discover and talk to each other. Um, secondly, we have a component called Rigel, and Rigel is a framework for creating digital media servers and digital media members. And finally, the last piece of the puzzle is a project called Delena, and Delena provides high-level APIs for building DLNA applications. And when I say DLNA applications, what I mean is applications that can take advantage, that can consume the services offered by digital media servers and digital media members. So all of these projects are released under a liberal license, they're all LGPL v2. Um, I, I have a little note at the end, um, Apache 2 is also mentioned, so Delena actually has some uh, two sets of APIs, it has DBus APIs and HTML5 APIs. And the HTML5 part is actually released under Apache. Um, but everything else is LGPL2. Um, they have a very flexible architecture, um, so this, they don't impose um, things like a media framework or a media indexer, they don't impose a user interface, they don't impose a set of applications that you need to use with these components. Uh, they have a very flexible architecture and you are you know, free to um, use these components as best suits the needs of your underlying platform. So you can you can achieve very tight integration with your underlying platform. Um, okay, <coughs> so we're going to spend the rest of the talk um, really looking at these open source projects in more detail, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll get some demos working as well. Okay, so let's uh, let's start talking about Rigel. Um, so Rigel is, is basically a framework for creating digital media servers and digital media renders. It's important not to think of Rigel as just a digital media server and just a digital media render. It's actually much more than this. So um, to really explain what I mean, I think we need to, to, to talk about what is actually involved in creating a digital media server and a digital media render. So basically, if you want to create a digital media server, you need three, three things. First of all, you're going to need a media indexer. And a media indexer is a piece of software that tracks all the media on your, on your device and then has some APIs that allow other processes and applications on your device to browse and search the media. Secondly, we're going to need a media framework. And a media framework um, is something like GStreamer that is capable of you know, decoding lots of different media files like MPEG or ABI and streaming this media. And finally, we need um, a protocol there. Um, I think I'll, I'll call it a, a UPnP section. And the UPnP section is something that actually implements these remote APIs. So the UPnP layer is the piece that you know um, actually publishes the APIs so that other remote clients can discover uh, the digital media server uh, and invoke commands on the digital media server. And of course, the way this works is the a remote device like a digital media player will do a browse request. It will send it to the UPnP protocol layer, and the UPnP protocol layer will delegate this browse command to the media indexer because it's the media indexer who knows you know, where the media is and what it's stored and how what the media hierarchy is like. And similarly, if, the, uh, if the, the digital media player wants to stream the media, it will send a command to the protocol layer, and the protocol layer will uh, delegate the streaming to, uh, to the media framework. 
So in RITAL, um, we have uh, the UPnP protocol there, um, but this is completely generic. So although it needs to talk to a media indexer uh, and a media framework, it doesn't talk to them directly. It does so through an abstract API. And this is really nice because it means that you can connect this UPnP protocol there up to different media indexers and different media frameworks. So you, this is what allows a really tight integration with your platform. So let's say you, uh, you're shipping a device, you've uh, licensed a, a media indexer from a third party, it's really, really fast. Um, you also have your own proprietary media framework that takes advantage of some special hardware decoding facility in your chip. And, um, and you want to connect, um, you want to build a DMS that takes advantage of both of these components. So with Rigel, this is really easy. You just need to create two separate plugins, uh, and, uh, and then you can you know, create a kind of an optimal digital media server for your platform. And digital media renderers are pretty much the same. So with a digital media renderer, we have a protocol there that you know, intercepts all of the commands like play and stop and you know, load this URL. Uh, but to actually play and play the URLs, um, it's going to delegate this, this task off to a media framework, such as something like Gmail. Uh, and you know, Rigel, again, the digital media renderer part is completely separate. Uh, sorry, the, the UPnP protocol there just has no hard dependencies on the media framework. So you can create a plugin to connect it up to GStreamer or any, any media frames that, um, that you have on your platform. So uh, Rigel itself is built on top of GUPnP. This is the UPnP uh, uh, project that we talked about, uh, and it's released under LGPL 2.1. So I have some architecture diagrams, uh, which I hope will clarify in a bit more detail uh, what, what we've just been talking about. So if you look at the bottom of this, um, this slide, you will see the GUPnP libraries, and you see we have these four libraries. Um, if you go one layer up, you see we have two kind of reddish boxes here, LibRigel Core and LibRigel Server. And these are the UPnP protocol layer that I talked about. So these two pieces are completely generic and exist in every implementation of a Rigel DMS. And secondly, we have two, um, two pieces um, that are uh, specific to a particular DMS. So first of all, we have a, GS, a GStreamer um, piece, and this um, you know, provides the DMS with um, the capability of streaming media using GStreamer. And secondly, we have a second piece over here called Media Export, and Media Export is um, a kind of plugin that connects up to a media indexer called Media Export. Incidentally, Media Export is Rigel's own uh, media indexer. But um, if, you, if you've got your own proprietary media indexer, you just need to replace that plugin with a bit of code that talks to your proprietary media indexer. So the renderer is pretty much the same. Um, again, we have GUPnP at the bottom. We have these two pieces, LibRigel Core and LibRigel Renderer. These are the generic um, digital media renderer protocol parts. These implement the uh, UPnP media renderer um, specifications. Uh, and in this particular instance, um, again, we're using GStreamer, so we have a GStreamer plugin that, um, that does all the rendering. Um, and right at the top, we have this, uh, this process, it's called the GStreamer Digital Media Render, and this connects all the pieces together. But this is a very small piece of code, because all of the code is sort of in these two uh, components here. Okay, so let's move on. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about delay now. So we talked about um, digital media servers and digital media renderers, and uh, we've, uh, we've looked at Rigel, which is a project for creating digital media servers and digital media renders. But really, to be able to consume the services uh, of digital media servers and digital media renders, and when I say consume the services, I really mean be able to take advantage of you know, the DLNA functionality that's built into our television sets, that's built into our smartphones, that's built into our set-top boxes, um, we need some DLNA-enabled apps. Um, so, for example, what do I mean by DLNA-enabled application? Well, you might want to um, um, you know, have a media player that's capable of playing remote content. You might want to be able to push an image from an email application or a photo application or a browser application you know, directly to a television set so everyone in the room can see what you're laughing at. Um, you might want to be able to upload um, uh, an image taken from your smartphone camera to your digital media server so um, it can be consumed by other devices. So these are the kind of things you can do with a DLNA application. Uh, but the problem we have at the moment is that most media applications in Linux do not allow you to do any, any of these things, right? 
Um, and the problem really is that, uh, that it's actually really hard to do these things on the moment because to communicate, to discover and communicate with these digital media servers, digital media renders, you need to write a huge amount of code and you need to do a huge amount of testing. You basically need a test lab full of lots of different devices to ensure that everything works correctly. So the Delano project was conceived to, to solve this problem. And it does this by providing very high level APIs um, for creating DLNA enabled applications. Now it provides two sets of APIs. Um, there's a set of DBus APIs for native applications and there are HTML5 APIs for HTML5 applications. Um, the, there were, there were, <laughs> so there are also two, um, two sort of, um, two functionality, two different areas of functionalities in the APIs. There's a, a component called Delaina Server, and Delaina Server offers APIs for discovering digital media servers and for browsing and searching their contents. And we have Delaina Renderer, which is uh, responsible for discovering digital media renderers and for manipulating these renderers. Okay, so um, just in brief, the APIs make it very easy to access the services of DMSs and DMRs. Um, they uh, are designed in such a way to reduce network traffic when multiple applications are running on the same device, and they're designed to improve uh, application startup time. And so this, these last two points are pretty important because you know, we're trying to create an environment here where every application on the device that you know, is capable of manipulating media uh, is also a DNA application. And so for this reason, it's important for us that you know, we don't have a huge amount of network traffic going on. And, uh, and it's also important that when you start this DLNA application, you instantly get a list of all the digital media servers and digital media renders uh, on the device. You don't have to wait for these things to be discovered. So um, Delena offers these, these features. It also supports some pretty advanced features of DLNA, such as upload to server, um, push, to, uh, push to renderer, uh, and uh, download synchronization. And this is what I was talking about earlier on with the car. This feature where you drive your car into the garage and your server uh, in the car automatically synchronizes with the server here. So again, it's built on top of GUPMP, and we use LGPL 2.1 um, for all of the native APIs and uh, JavaScript for the C APIs. Uh, sorry, for the HTML file. <laughs> we use Apache 2 for the JavaScript APIs. So here's a, a diagram showing the Delaney architecture. So again, at the bottom, you have the GUPMP libraries. And so this is important because it means that um, all of uh, both Rigel and Delaney use the same UPMP stack. Um, secondly, one level up, we have um, the two Delaney APIs, Delaney <coughs> Server and Delaney Renderer. Delaney Server and Delaney Renderer have some um, code in common, and this is isolated into a separate library called the Delaney Core. If we go one further level up, you see some applications that, that are using the Delena APIs. So we have a media player, which is you know, using Delena server to discover and stream remote media. And we also have a podcast application that's using Delena renderer to play podcasts out of a loudspeaker or out of a telephone set. Uh, and right at the top, we have a browser, and we have some HTML5 applications in the browser. So a photo viewer, which is capable of you know, displaying remote photos and pushing these photos to renderers. And we have a digital media controller application. Now, these HTML5 applications use um, an API called Cloud Delena. So Cloud Delena provides the JavaScript APIs for creating DLNA applications. Currently, in our current architecture, Cloud Delena um, uses a component called, a piece of middleware called Cloudybus. So Cloudybus is a little bit complicated. I don't want to get in, into it in too much detail, but essentially Cloudybus is a, um, a piece of middleware that creates JavaScript proxy objects for Dbus objects. And uh, so it uses Dbus introspection to automatically populate these JavaScript objects with the objects, with the properties and signals and methods that are present <coughs> in the underlying Dbus objects. So basically what happens is um, if you call a, a Cloudybus function, um, Cloudybus sends some data down a web socket to the Cloudybus server, and then the Cloudybus server passes this, um, this command on to either to the server or to the Okay, so I'm going to try and do some demos. <laughs> this is not really a very good environment for doing demos, but um, let's hope we can get everything to work. First of all, I have to find the home switch. Okay, so um, to start off with, I'm going to show you what the APIs look like. Um, 
So Okay, so to start off with, I want to show you um, what the APIs look like. Um, so this is probably not much use to uh, people who aren't programmers, but the idea here is really to show you how high level these APIs are and how easy they are to use. So um, first of all, can you guys read that? Yes. So first of all, um, I'm going to run some demos in Python. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a search to find all of the servers on the network. So you can see I have one digital media server, and it's actually running on this computer here. So uh, what I can do now is I can uh, create an object um, that I can use to explore and manipulate this server. Now I have the object, I can retrieve some information about the server. So there's tons of information here. Uh, most of this isn't very interesting to you guys, but uh, we have some stuff here like, um, for example, the name of the server, we have the URL of the server's icon and so forth. Um, and I can do stuff like searching for files. So um, I'm going to try and do a search for all video files. Okay, so I've done a search for all the video files on this server. I found three different files, and you can see their names, uh, and you can see their URLs. So what I'm going to try and do now, so what I'm going to try and do now is I'm going to use the render APIs to try and play one of those videos. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to do um, a search to see how many renders I've got. I've got one render on the, on the PC, and the render is XBMC. Hopefully you guys can see this up here. So secondly, I'm going to ask the renderer to play one of the video files. So let's go with this one. Actually, first of all, I need to create a, uh, an object for the renderer. And now I've done that, I can try and open up a URL. The URL or URI? It's URI. Okay. And now, hopefully, I should be able to play. Okay. So this isn't a very good video, it's actually a video at the back of my head, but what I'm trying to show here is that the APIs are really, really simple, right? It's play, stop, open URI. Um, you can do pause, you can do you know, fast forward, you can change the volume, uh, and so forth. And you do this with basically one line of code. Now, underneath what's happening here, there's a huge amount of stuff happening here. There's XML documents being generated, the SOAP requests being sent, there's loads of data being parsed. But, um, but all of this is hidden from the application developers. So as you can see, if you're doing something in Python, you can, you know, you can implement um, a push to a renderer or, or upload something to a server in you know, five lines of code. It's really, really simple. Okay, so now we're going to go and see some real uh, DLNA applications that are being written using these APIs. So the first one is something called uh, 
Cloud Delena. This is actually a, a digital media controller written using the uh, Delena HTML5 API. Now, it's probably the ugliest digital media controller um, <laughs> ever written, but uh, it does demonstrate some interesting things. First of all, it demonstrates that you can build these applications in HTML5 using the Delena APIs. Um, and secondly, uh, you know, this is actually UPnP certified, this application. And we're currently in the process of getting DLNA certification for it. As we speak, it's sitting in a test center in Belgium getting tested. Um, and uh, you know, in our test lab, it passes all the DLNA tests. So we really hope that we can get certification for this in the coming weeks. So it might be ugly, but um, you know, it does serve some, some useful purposes. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do some browsing here. Um, I'm going to select. Actually, you see in the top um, corner, we have a list of servers and a list of renders. There's one server at the moment, and there's one render. And so I'm just going to try and play some, some files. Um, so what I'm doing here, down here, is I'm browsing the contents of the server. And I'm instructing, uh, I'm using this application here to instruct this renderer to play the files. So if I just select the files, you can see that uh, I know it's, <laughs> it's not very bright, but hopefully you get the idea that uh, that um, the pictures are appearing. Okay, um, and we can do more than pictures, right? We can do we can do video. So um, let's go for something different. Not the back of my head this time. So <coughs> you can see, and I can pause, and I can play, and I should also be able to do a seek. Where to do it? Oh, there. So, ah. I think I have a slight problem with my projector. Okay, so. You get the idea. Um, so now I want to show you a native application. Um, actually, I think, I think that's better. It was running off the battery. It's a little bit brighter now. So now I'm going to show you a native application um, built using the Delena APIs. Okay. Um, so this native application, it's uh, it's something called Slide Push. Okay, and so the goal of this application is to use, uh, to be able to display a PowerPoint presentation on a digital media render such as a television set. And normally this isn't possible, and the reason it's not possible is because digital media renderers do not support PowerPoint presentation file format, right? All they support are images. They don't even support PDF. And so what this application does, it's a small Python application, it's about 300 lines of code. It allows you to um, select a PowerPoint presentation such as the one we were just looking at. It converts it to a set of images. Um, and then it allows you to browse through the various images. Okay, uh, And I don't know if you can see, but down at the bottom here, we have a little combo box. And this combo box shows us all of the, uh, the digital media it's renderers in the network. And so basically, you select your renderer down here, and then you select your slide, and then you hit return. and uh, you can, uh, you can push your PowerPoint presentation to, uh, to a television set. Um, and you know, this is actually, uh, I mean, it's a toy example. It's built to demonstrate the kind of applications you can build with Dilling. But there are some practical use cases here, because you do have some uh, projectors that actually support DLNA. So you know, wirelessly, from your phone, you could, you could do a presentation using, using this application. OK, so I have one more demo I'm going to try and do. Uh, this, <laughs> this is a, a little ambitious, um, so I need to connect this guy up to the network. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to show you uh, oops. Okay, 
very slowly. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to show you is uh, another type of integration, and this time the integration is done with the browser. And so what we've done here is we've created a Firefox extension called TeleRenderer. Um, and TeleRenderer is, uses the Delena APIs to allow you to push images directly from the browser to a television set, for example. Uh, and uh, you know it's really, really simple. It's only 50 lines of code, 50 lines of JavaScript. Uh, and so basically, you can click on a, an image like this, and you right-click on the image, and you see there's a new menu item called TeleRenderer. And if you expand TeleRenderer, you get a list of all the digital media renders on the network. And if you select one, and if we're lucky, <laughs> Uh, you should see the image appear. Okay, this is pretty cool. So it means you know you have very tight um, integration with your applications and DLNA, and so you can you can be you know browsing Facebook, you can see a funny picture, and you can just push it straight to your television set, and so everyone can see what you're laughing. So. Um, Go back to my presentation. Okay, so, okay, so um, I have one more demo, but I think I'm going to skip it because I'm not sure I'll have enough time. Um, okay, so I have some other stuff I want to talk about here, and uh, and I think this is quite important for you know people building IDI systems. And my message here is that you, although all these components are free, and although you know they're developed in upstream, and there's lots of functionality, and they're pretty well tested, um, building a you know a DLNA compliant system that works really well, it's well integrated. Um, is a lot more work than just packaging up the components and sticking them in, 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 your, in your platform. So um, basically, uh, there are a number of integration issues that you will need to address. Um, so firstly, you know, the most important thing is you need to have a digital media, sorry, you need to have a media framework, so something like GStreamer, that is capable of playing all of the DLNA media content that's mandated by the DLNA. So remember at the start of the talk, I said that there's a set of um, you know, media formats that you need to support, um, and so if you're going to integrate, um, you know, Rigel, for example, as a renderer into your platform, you need to ensure that your media uh, framework is capable of playing all of the standard test content. Um, okay, and secondly, you know, you actually need to write some code that connects Rigel up to your media framework. Now, you don't need to write this code if you're using GStreamer because the code's already written, but if you're using a different media framework, you need to write some code. Uh, and again, it's the same if you're using a proprietary media indexer or a media indexer that's not supported by Rigel, you're going to need to write some code, you're going to need to write a plugin that connects um, Rigel up to, um, to your media indexer. Right? Uh, another issue is content protection. So, you know, DLNA supports something called link protection and it does this using a protocol called DTCPIP. Now the idea behind link protection is that it allows, it protects content when it's being streamed from one device to another. And remember we talked about the set-top box, um, you know, downloading a movie onto your set-top box, now this movie is going to be protected, right? Um, and uh, when it's on the set-top box, but you also need to ensure that it's protected when you stream it to a tablet, for example. And this is done by a protocol called DTCPIP. Now, because of the way so DTCP IP is licensed, it will never be possible to create an open source DLNA, uh, an open source DTP IP stack. So if you need to support link protection in your, in your platform, and you're using these open source components, you will need to license the DTCP IP stack from someone else. But our goal is to make sure that this entire DLNA stack um, is flexible enough to allow you to take a third party DTCP IP stack and slot it into the system. So we're going to guarantee that all the hooks are in place um, to allow you to do this. Internally, in Intel, we have our own DTC PIP stack, so we're actually in a position you know, to, to test this and make sure it works. But we will never be able to you know, release this software, the, the DCP IP implementation. Okay, so there's other things you need to do. You're gonna need a settings application. Um, so a classic example here is, you wanna have some sort of control over, uh, over what's shared. 
So, you know, do you want to share any media at all? In which case, you're going to want to turn off media sharing. Do you want to, um, uh, you know, do you just want to share videos? Do you want to share um, photos? Um, or do you want to just share one particular folder? So, you know, we, all, we need to give the user pretty tight control over what gets shared. Uh, and to do this, you need some sort of user interface. Um, and another point is that we're going to need to modify our applications to take advantage of the delayed API. So, you know, we need to modify our email application so we can upload images to folders, uh, to digital media servers, or we can push these images to television sets. We need to modify the browser application, like we've seen. We need to modify the media player so they can discover and play remote content. Um, and the final point is that you need to um, get this thing certified. So, and there's two levels of certification here. There's UPnP certification, and this is a pre prerequisite for going for DNA certification. So you need to get UPnP certification for all the components, and then you need to get DNA certification for all the components. Internally in Intel, we are trying to get certification for as many of the components as possible, but this certification, you know, is not transferable. So if you change anything in the software stack, like the media indexer, or even the, you know, I think even the, the, the network stack, and that invalidates the certification. So what this means is that if you want to use the software to build a certifiable DNA device, you will need to go through the certification process yourself. But the fact that we're running all the test tools and we're trying to get our own certification means that you shouldn't run into any problems because all the problems, at least on the protocol there, should have been solved by us already. Um, okay, so I might just take um, one moment uh, to talk about what we're doing in Tizen. So in Tizen 2.0, Tizen IVI, I should be clear, in Tizen IVI 2.0, um, all of these components have already been integrated. So the DMS is there, the DMR is there, and the Delena APIs are there. Um, but the problem is that we haven't um, done any of this integration. So although the components are there and are functional, there's no integration done with the application, there's no settings application, we're not connected up to the Tizen Media Indexer, we're currently using our own Media Indexer. So going forward, what we really need to do now is start to you know, do this integration to give users of Tizen IDI a much better uh, DNA experience. So I will attempt one more demo, I think, that I forgot to do. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to try one more demo, and uh, what I want to do here is just to, um, to demonstrate a bit of interoperability with another device, and the device I'm going to use is an iPhone, and um, Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if this works, I'm going to take a picture of you guys. <coughs> and then I have a, a digital media server on the iPhone. This is called Media Connect. So I'm going to start this and turn on media sharing. And if we're very lucky, in a couple of seconds, we should see some extra servers popping up here. And there we are. And so I have a server here called Photo Library, and this is the camera roll on my iPhone. So I should be able to select, there's two pictures. I'm not sure why there's two pictures, but I should be able to select one of the pictures and display over here. And hopefully it's the right one. And there you are. So there you guys are. So you can see that, that I'm not faking this, and there really is, a, you know, you can connect different digital media servers on and do this. Okay, so I think I'm going to stop here and uh, open the floor to questions. Um, so please go ahead. Is there a security mechanism for um, choosing what devices can access the, the media on the server? There is, um, there is a security mechanism in, in UPnP, something called device protection, and it defines a whole set of you know, roles and authentication and stuff. But uh, we don't currently support this, and it's not mandated by DLNA. Um, so, and security is actually a very interesting issue, and something that perhaps I should talk about in a bit more detail. So, in DLNA and UPnP, there is no security. You know, 
okay, there is this device protection protocol, but, but nobody implements it at the moment. Um, so there's no security. And basically, the protocols assume that they're running on a secure network. And this was probably a reasonable assumption in the late 90s when you know, these, sort of, these sort of protocols were developed, but it's not really a safe um, assumption today, particularly if you're running this stuff on a laptop or a mobile phone and you're connecting your laptop and your mobile phone up to you know, uh, <laughs> a coffee shop Wi-Fi networks. So uh, you know, obviously you don't want to be sharing your, your media on these Wi-Fi networks, but it's also not really safe to run um, applications, DNA applications on these Wi-Fi networks either because of the way the UPnP protocol works. So the, the application itself could become an attack vector. So security is a very important consideration for, um, for deploying a, a DLNA system. It's perhaps not so important in IBI because you're not going to be connecting your, your car up to, to Wi-Fi networks and coffee shops, but for mobile uh, and uh, laptops, it's, it's really important. So, so oh, sorry. So at home, the security would be provided by the Wi-Fi router that you have set up that you know, all the communications go with the, with the different devices communicate with. Uh, right, yes. You know, assuming that you set up password and uh, Yes, that's correct, that's correct, that's correct. But you know what, you, you want to avoid the situation where you're running an application that supports DNA, you leave it running, you disconnect from your home network, you connect to a network in a coffee shop, and instantly this thing, you know, starts sharing media or, you know, it, 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 it becomes a, an attack vector. So these are things you need to disable. And so currently on my laptop here, I have, um, I have certain trusted networks where in the firewall where everything's connected and all other networks are untrusted and UPnP is not working. So this is currently how I'm blocking things. But, uh, you know, I have run the applications before at conferences and it's, 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 it's quite frightening when you see the list of digital media servers that pop up and you see the list of people who are sharing their media, presumably, unbeknownst to them. So it's a very important step, a very important issue. Yeah, go to the DRF content sharing. Sorry? DRF content. Right. So the does UPNA or cloud this way, UPNP or the DLNA, and they choose it to support the DRF? I'm well, sure. it, it For link protection, it uses this protocol called DTCPIP, and in the standards, the, in the guidelines, there is a, um, some information about how you can connect this stuff up to different DRM systems. And it talks about different DRM systems, but I'm afraid I don't know in detail which ones. Um, the guidelines talk about, and I also don't know if it's restricted to working with a certain set of DRM systems. Would you support the CPIP on the IS or so? So, in, you know, in Tizen upstream, DTCPIP will never be supported because it cannot be open sourced. But you know, we will internally in Intel, you know, we will build, um, uh, you know. Uh, digital media player that's capable of streaming protected content over DTCPIP, and we will be able to demonstrate this, and we will be able to talk about the architecture, but we will never be able to release the code, and we won't even be able to release the binary of it. Um, but at least we can demonstrate it can be done, and then you know we can document how it's to be done, and then if you want to create a Tizen system that uses our components and supports DTCPIP, you'll have to go to someone and license the stack and, and just plug it in. But you know, it's our goal to make sure that this is possible. Hi. Does it happen to support uh, any way to stream things through Bluetooth, or is it only simply through standard? Yes, I, I believe you, you can stream things through Bluetooth as well. I mean, it works over any IP network. So if you create a, a kind of a, if you if, if you can run the IP of Bluetooth, then then yes, it definitely works. Be kind of a way to do something more secure in the car. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Although I, I would the bandwidth be sufficient for streaming movies and probably not. <laughs> They're working on that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So possibly in the future. And, and you know, this is mentioned in the DLNA guidelines. It does talk about Bluetooth. And it does. Uh, it does mention that this is a possibility. Personally, I've never tried it, but, um, but it shouldn't be too difficult to, to get to work in Tyson, so it would be interesting to, to check this out. Do 
Do we have any more questions? I think this is perfectly timed. We have 25 seconds left. <laughs> okay, I think I think that's it. Um, thanks very much for your time.